to speak a little bit more about meditation, about the, um, the the meaning of meditation, about the the process of discovery of uh, our own hearts that we uh, experience in our practice. Like I guess most of you, I was um, brought up <coughs> to have uh, certain spiritual beliefs. I was brought up as a Catholic and uh, gave away my, my religious beliefs when I was about 15 or so, as I did not think that they uh, withstood uh, the inquiries of reason and science and so on. And uh, because I had an inquiring mind and I wanted to know about the truth of things, uh, I studied philosophy and read uh, books by uh, Plato and Nietzsche and Dostoevsky and uh, James Joyce and other people who uh, are supposed to be uh, intellectuals, supposed to be, have some kind of insight into the world and uh, how the world is, what makes it up, and what's, what are we doing here, what's the meaning of our life here. And uh, I guess because of that, then, then I had a kind of feeling of somehow I thought, that, I thought that I had some kind of grasp on things. I thought that I had some kind of... Um, you know, notion of what the world was and how to live in it. Uh, and yet, despite that, uh, I still was very unable to recognize and deal with uh, my own emotions. And... Uh, These things would come and go like a, a, a passing, like the weather sort of passing by and you kind of learn to live with it, uh, to sort of recognize it and so on, but not to really understand it. And so as the result of living like that, then um, you know, whenever you feel uh, happy, positive, then you get caught up in that. And you can experience some very, you know, very blissful and very uh, high states of mind. But then, of course, things turn around. Sometimes they turn around for a reason. Sometimes it's death or you know, financial failure or something like that. Other times there doesn't seem to be so much of a reason, but just that uh, the world seems to turn against you. As one of the uh, uh, episodes in the Lord of the Rings, this was not one of the uh, major events there, but one of the, the little minor events at the beginning of the story, uh, which really sort of encaptures... Uh, that aspect of, of life, which is when the, the hobbits, if they've gone, just left the Shire and they went into the old wood. And they're trying to find a path through the old wood that was next to the Shire. And as they were walking through there, somehow the path kept on shifting, like they couldn't, as if they couldn't uh, keep in a constant direction. And uh, always they kept on wanting to go. Uh, upwards and out uh, of the forest, but somehow the forest almost was conspiring against them. And so it was almost uh, driving them uh, against their will, 
down and into the heart of the forest rather than up and out of it. And uh, when they got down to the, eventually they gave up. They, 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 they couldn't make it anymore. And eventually they got driven down to the very center of the forest where there was the, the evil old, old man Willow who then swallowed them up. So they had to be rescued. And that's, that's very interesting if we look at, at uh, <coughs> how that, that allegory is used. Because uh, in, the, in, in the, the, the Lord of the Rings, the way that that's presented, obviously there's a love of nature is part of it. But also, as well as that love of nature and respect for it, there's also this, this um, recognition that there is this dark side as well, this dark side of uh, the forces of nature. And, and sometimes it's just like that. It feels like we're kind of struggling out of it, but as if we're getting swept around and around, like we're swirling around and about to go down the plug hole, no matter what we can try to do. And uh, the more we try to get out of it, the, we, we, we just can't, and eventually we, we run out of energy and we just give up. And so this is a very uh, kind of wonderful metaphor for these, these times in our lives when, when there seems to be some kind of gravity, some kind of black hole uh, whose influence we can't escape. And so uh, at that time in my life and, and, and I was playing music and so on and, and you know, would go through these different emotional phases and so on. And in a sense I could appreciate these things and I could uh, you know, express them through music and that would help in some way. But I still didn't really understand it. I didn't really understand what was going on. And, I, and all of those things which I used to try to understand and to try to deepen my uh, growth and my, my, my wisdom, all of them were in a sense kind of... Um, beating around the bush. They were, they were kind of avoiding the central issue. I didn't know what the central issue was. And it wasn't until I, I kind of stumbled into Thailand and, and uh, wandered uh, my way up to Chiang Mai. And in that, that kind of journey was the opposite kind of journey. That's not the journey where everything is conspiring against you, but the kind of journey where Somehow it seems as if the forces of providence are uh, on your side. And so I ended up drifting into a monastery and, and uh, doing this very intensive <coughs> retreat. And this was really that very, very profound insight that happened to me on that first retreat uh, and that I've never uh, shaken or that has, that has remained central to my life since then. And, and that is simply the mindfulness for mindful awareness of one's own consciousness and the realization that actually everything comes from there and to be able to really look into your mind to be able to really realize what is happening in your mind right now to actually see that to actually um, hmm, directly, face to face, confront that awareness which is at the heart of our lives, the heart of all our experience. And so this was like a, re a total revelation for me. It had never even occurred to me that this kind of thing was possible. And I hadn't found any precedent, even though I had a reasonably uh, good knowledge of, of uh, Western thought and philosophy and so on and so forth. But I hadn't found any precedent for, that would explain to me the importance of this, still less anything which uh, would give me a, a clear and structured and, and um, uh, meaningful, practical way of doing it. <coughs> And so when I went 
uh, to the monastery, and it was almost uncanny. I, f- I found that it was quite uncanny how how the people there who experienced in meditation would would know what was happening to me, would know what kind of phases you go through, and what the particular kinds of issues were happening, and so on and so forth. And uh, there was this whole kind of world is opening up, and then when that opens up, you realize that uh, all of those other things, in a sense, so that doesn't, I'm not saying completely, but in a sense, all of those other things are taking us away from the issue at hand. And so the more we look at all of those things, the more we forget to look at the mind which is at the heart of those things. And so there's something irreducible and essential about this practice of turning one's mind and focusing it solely and exclusively on the awareness, the consciousness as it's happening now. And I should mention or I should emphasize that um, while that r- remains very true, I've also come to appreciate uh, since then uh, that <clears throat> those other uh, aspects of life and of the mind also have their uh, importance and are also, in a sense, irreducible uh, so that... Um, uh, using thought well to consider, reflect uh, on uh, philosophy or on the meaning of life and, and so on and so forth, these things are also important. They're not uh, negated or, or undermined by the practice of meditation. But there are two rather different kinds of things going on. One thing that's going on is a, 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 a sense of dialogue or a communication, and this is like something which is shared among a community. And so there's something about us as humans and as sentient beings where we exist and um, form ourselves in relationships and in community. Okay? So this is where in Buddhism we have the notion of what we call Sangha. Okay? Sangha is a spiritual community. And a Sangha is comprised of many different individuals who are all at different levels of spiritual development, but the values which are embodied by the Sangha or by the community itself uh, are not necessarily, we can't reduce them to the, to, the, to the levels of the individuals within that group. So I'm, when I'm saying this, don't, don't mistake me, I'm not saying anything particularly uh, profound. Uh, you know, in a sense, we can say in the same way that that you know, we can look at, say, for example, the United Nations and the, the United Nations Charter of Human Rights and Bill of Rights and all of these kinds of things. And if you look at those things, which is I recommend that you do, you can find them all on the web. And you, know, you can see there's actually very exalted ideals of how human beings should live together. So in a sense, there's this ideal which is agreed upon as a community, a world, global community, that we should aspire towards. We should aspire towards the elimination of poverty. We should aspire towards uh, equal rights for women. We should aspire to uh, eliminate racism and so on and so forth. And these are values which are shared at a level of the, the, the communal or the global discourse in our times. Of course, they're not actually practiced. Okay? And most people or a lot of people a lot of the time don't put those things into practice. But that doesn't mean that there's something wrong with them. Okay? It just means that it's not perfect yet. It just means that there's, it's in a process and, and that not every individual or every group within that large group is at that same moral or ethical level. And so then that's a process of growth, development, education, and so on and so forth. So it's the same thing within our spiritual life, that our own level of meditation and spiritual development is not... Uh, has no direct relationship with the, the values and uh, um, uh, the way of operating and so on of us as a cr- group and as a community. 
And I think that's something very important for Buddhists, especially new Buddhists and non-traditional Buddhists, to, to appreciate because I think that we're often very naive when we come to Buddhism and we think that if somebody's enlightened, somebody has got good meditation and so on and so forth, therefore, therefore the structures and the institutions which they represent or which they're a part of must also share those same enlightened values. Okay? And this obviously is not the case. It might be the case sometimes, but in many cases it's not. And so there's no direct or straightforward one-to-one -one relationship between these things. And the most obvious example of this today, which is such a glaring and very painful example, is the case of Myanmar, where we have a country which has perhaps the most brutal and revolting military regime in the world, certainly one of the worst, if not the worst in the world. And yet it's a country where uh, you also perhaps have a greater proportion of people meditating than we have anywhere else in the world. So on the individual level, you have many, many people, thousands of them, who are very developed and have very purified consciousness. And yet the social structures are incredibly oppressive. And so there's no simple one-to-one -one relationship between those two things. On the one hand, they might help each other. So on the one hand, obviously, if somebody purifies their mind, let's say a government minister comes, they do a meditation retreat, they purify their mind, well, hopefully they would bring those values back into the society. Okay? That's one way that it would work. Another way it might work in a completely opposite direction so that people who might have worked to help the social structures give up because things are too bad. They go into the monastery and they just sit and meditate and internalize the external problems. Okay? And so in that case can actually sustain the, these, the problems happening on a social level. So again, just the point I'm making here is there's no one-to-one -one simple or direct relationship between the individual development or level of consciousness and the level of development of the group. Okay? So this is something which I've come to appreciate more and more in recent years, and I think uh, it's very important for us to reflect on and to understand. So when we, when we, when we understand like this, we realize that, that we can't reduce one or other model. Okay? So if you come from, say, a Marxist background or something, then you try to reduce everything to a materialistic social level, okay? and you ignore the other levels. Okay, and that's missing an important part of the picture. And that's that part of the picture which is what Buddhism and Buddhist practice specializes in. Okay? It's not the whole of Buddhism, but the specialization, the central emphasis on Buddhism is that looking into your heart and realizing and developing uh, the purity of one's own consciousness. And so. That is a task which I think at, uh, sooner or later all of us are going to have to confront. Okay? If we want to develop spiritually, if we want to become uh, enlightened, if we want to... Um, stop those cycles of uh, ignorance and confusion which have been causing us so much pain for so many years, then we are going to have to somehow turn back the clock, un unspiral the spiral, or as, as it says in the suttas, to untangle the tangle. And so untangling this tangle is something we can do. We do little bit by little bit, step by step. And the, the, the basic or the essential essence of that practice is just that simple fact of looking at oneself in a mirror. And so the Buddha used this exact simile. He said, you know, what is the purpose of a mirror? It's for the purpose of reflection. So in the same way, meditation is for the purpose of reflection. You can come and sit down to meditate 
and we reflect and we look into our own mind. Now, one of the things that we uh, realize then is that, you know, I mentioned before that that so many times the, the, the things we want to solve in the external world are a distraction from the real issues going on in the heart. Okay? And so it's almost as if we cook up. That's not that's not that's not just an accident, okay? It doesn't just 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 happen to be the case, okay? But we actually cook up all of those things in the external world, and I can't, when I say cook up, I mean it can be completely literally. Okay, we can actually cook things in the kitchen, uh, making food to, to take us away from our meditation, and that's what I spent most of my first meditation retreat doing. And uh, so, when I talked before about saying that that um, you know you spend a lot of the time when we're meditating, not actually meditating, well, on my, on my first retreat. Because I, I used to like to cook, you see. So on my first retreat, I, I, I wrote this fantastic recipe book, you know. And uh, it would have been really good. I could have made a lot of money from it. And all of these great ideas that I had. And, uh, and so on. So we're cooking, literally cooking, all of these things outside the mind. So this is like on the, 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 ex, the outer layers of the mind, yeah? So we can think of the mind as like a, a series of spheres, which is kind of like a bit kind of almost like an atmosphere or something like that. It becomes more diffuse as it gets further out, and then and then concentrates as it comes further in. And those out, we find ourselves looking at those outer layers of the mind, and projecting onto them. And and of course these are all the the tricks of Mara. So Mara, uh, of course, all of you are very familiar with Mara. He's the one who comes to greet you whenever you come to sit meditation. <laughs> you sit down and to meditate. And Mara comes along and says, hello, here we are again, my old friend. Yeah? And uh, Mara's not like the, the devil in, in, in Christianity. You know, he's got kind of horns and whips and fire and all of these kinds of things. Mara's not like that at all. Mara is very friendly and very nice. And he comes along to you in meditation and says, oh, Really, your back's so sore now. I think you maybe you need to you need to go and see a chiropractor, or maybe you need to go have a little bath and lie down in, in some hot water. I think that would really be a lot better for you than doing this meditation. It's not, you know, meditations. Yeah, it's all right, but it's it's not really kind of a natural posture, is it? Because you're kind of forcing yourself to be still and and things. And <sighs> yeah, I think that's enough, don't you? Five minutes, that's plenty, you know, and. Uh, Time to oh there must be oh did you did you leave the kettle on? Better go and check that now. Oh and there was that thing I was supposed to and so this is Mara okay. Mara is not something who not somebody who is very distant and very remote from us. Mara is our best friend. Mara is our companion for life. Yeah, we've known him since we were young, and he's become so familiar to us that. We, we don't recognize, we don't see through him. But the thing about Mara is that Mara is the uh, expert in disguises. Okay? So the word Mara uh, as a word is related to the word Marana, which is death, or literally in English, the English cognate is mortality. So Mara is death. And death comes in a million and one disguises. Okay? And so when we're seeing things in the world, we're always seeing these things, but actually they're all Maras because they're all death in disguise. And this point was put very, very brilliantly by Ajahn Chah. And someone <coughs> came to him once and said, what's uh, right view? Yeah? It's the first factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, right view. He said, what's right view? And he held up this cup and said, see this cup? He said, it's broken already. Yeah? The cup is broken already. That's, this is the right view. Yeah? Because when you say it's broken already, that means you've seen through Mara's disguise. Mara's disguise tells you that this cup is nice, this cup is clean, the cup is whole, the cup is useful, and so on and so forth. And so you get attached to it. And you don't reflect that the cup is impermanent. And it's not impermanent. The reason why he said it's broken already is because it's not impermanent in the sense that 
uh, something might happen to it and it might break. Yeah? It's impermanent because it's its very nature to break. And it always has been that way since it's been created. Its nature is what is the word, vayadhamma, the nature to disintegrate. And so even as we're watching that now, it's actually disintegrating. Yeah? It's just disintegrating over, over a long time scale so we don't notice it. Yeah? And Mara comes and says, oh, it's all right, it's a nice cup. <laughs> Have a drink of water. So when we come to sit down and meditate, Mara comes to us in all these million and one disguises. Okay? Now, what we have to ask ourselves is, why does Mara become particularly concerned when we're sitting in meditation? And this is something people often experience. You know, you go through your daily life, Everything's kind of fine. You're not really worried about it. And then you come to sit meditation and then all this stuff happens, yeah? All these kind of emotions come back to you or all these kind of memories or, or somehow, you, you know, before a lot of people feel that maybe they, they um, uh, you know, when you meditate, maybe you want to watch your breath. And you've been going through your whole life breathing. You say, well, see, everyone's sitting there right now breathing. We all know how to breathe. You come to sit to meditate. We don't know how to breathe anymore, yeah? And, go, and it gets really tight, and our stomach gets sort of tightened up, and our brow gets. And, and we, we, we've forgotten how to breathe. Yeah? We've forgotten how to breathe. This is something even a newborn baby knows how to do. And this is Mara. Yeah? And Mara goes to these incredible lengths to concoct these amazing stories. So you'll notice that in your, when, you, when you're meditating, that because your mind becomes purified and stronger, that actually your imaginative and creative powers become much stronger. Yeah? And so this, this, this has a very positive side. If, if, you, if, you know, if you need to do anything like that, if you're you know, a creative person or an artist or something like that, then, or even if just, just with ordinary everyday problems, and you know, this, this will happen to you so often. It's happened to me so often that I, I don't even... It's just, for me, it's just totally normal that, you know, if you've got some problem or issue, you don't know, quite know about it or whatever, when you come to, you come to meditate and, and it'll, the answer will come to you. That's it. And it happens almost every time you sit to med meditate, you know. It happens so often that it just becomes completely normal that, oh, yeah, and, and that problem, then that's, that's solved, yeah. And these things kind of resolving themselves. And so that's, of course, one of the very, very wonderful benefits of meditation. But... It's also a subtle disguise of Mara, okay? Because then that leads us in that direction, okay? We, we, we think, oh, what a great idea, yeah? And so we start to follow it, and we start to follow it. And we forget that the reason why we had that great idea was because we weren't, we weren't following it. As long as we keep on following it and hounding it and working on it, we'll never have any big ideas, we'll never have any great ideas, we'll never have any insights, because our minds are working. It's only when our minds stop working that that natural intuition arises. Yeah? And so that's the other anecdote. I've, I think I've told this several times before, but this is a very, very good one. Is, is Mara and the Buddha were standing watching a man uh, walking along and uh, the man stopped. And he saw, he found, as he was walking along, he suddenly he stopped. And he found a piece of the truth, bent down and picked it up. He found a piece of truth on the road, bent down and picked it up. And when he did that, Mara smiled. And the Buddha said to him, Mara, that man just found the truth. How come you're smiling? You're the lord of deceit. You're the lord of lies. Why are you smiling when the man's found the truth? And Mara said, oh, well... Just give him five minutes and he'll make a doctrine out of it. <laughs> so this is how Mara works. Yeah? Those things that happen in your meditation that are very good, Mara is just waiting. Why? And Mara is incredibly diligent and alert when you're meditating. Why? Because he is terrified. Because Mara is so scared 
that you are about to escape his grip. Yeah? And he knows. As soon as someone comes to sit down and meditate, this alarm bells go off in Mara's office. He's sitting up there in the Paranimita Vasavati Deva realm, relaxing. You know, he's got his, his high-D TV and, and all these kinds of things. He's having a good time. And suddenly these alarm bells go, ding, 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 ding. Someone's meditating. Oh, my God, I've go, got to go down and, and, uh, and uh, get them out of the meditation. I've got to think of another disguise. He'll go quickly into his, his, his uh, wardrobe room and uh, put on a disguise to come down and uh, go for you. So the fact that Mara is coming to you like that is good. Okay? He's scared. He knows that you're, you've rumbled his game. Okay? You know what he's about. Okay? And so, in a sense, it's very easy. Dealing with, dealing with Mara in Buddhism is a piece of cake. Yeah? I know you, Mara. And we see that in the suttas, every time when Mara comes, he visits one of the monks or nuns, he visits the Buddha or something, what do they say? I know you, Mara. You are Mara, the evil one. Come to distract me from my meditation. Yeah? And that's all that's needed. And he goes, drats, foiled again. Yeah? And there's, there's very wonderful descriptions where it talks about that in the sutta. And it says, Mara went off and sat down on the ground, head down, shoulders drooping, glum, with nothing to say, scratching the ground with a stick, like that. <laughs> yeah? And so that's how easy it is to defeat Mara. Yeah? But of course, he'll always come back again. right? So it's not a final victory, but just to know that. So when all of these things come up in our meditation, we're looking into the mind. You, Whenever... Anything is distracting you from your meditation, your meditation object. Okay, I know you, Mara. And then you come back. And when you keep on coming back like that, the, well, I was talking before about this external nature of the mind, the fact that the mind manifests and projects itself out like in these external layers. This means that like the, the point of view is inside, inside here and is always looking out. Yeah? And, and so the mind, like a camera, is, can't look at itself. Okay, this is the essential problem in meditation, is the mind doesn't want to look at the mind or almost can't know the mind. And this was this, this tremendous insight which was uh, expressed before the Buddha in the Upanishads. And it talks about the, the unseen seer, the unheard hearer, the unsmelt smeller, the unthought thinker, the uncognized cognizer. Yeah? the unknown knower. Yeah? Who is that? Yeah? And this was the essential question uh, that was posed in the Upanishads, in the, the, the pre-Buddhist tradition. Who is that? Yeah? And of course the Upanishadic answer was, well, that is yourself. The Buddhist answer is that that is the mind. This is the nature of the mind to understand this. The mind is, is looking outside... And so we can't know the knower. Okay? The knowing can't know itself. But the essential point is that, that because those things outside us, those, things, those, those external layers of the mind, are essentially projections from the mind, okay? we can see them in reflection. Okay? So we reflect on the mind. We can see that in reflection and come to understand. And the more we do that and the more refined and subtle it is, the closer it comes to home. The more close that becomes to seeing the actual mind itself. Yeah? And it comes closer and closer and closer and closer. And then in, in very deep insight, then this is where we start to actually unravel the, uh, the nature of the mind. And so this is why... We need to make our minds, in our meditation, we can't see the truth of this unknown knower just by thinking about it. We can't know the truth of this unknown knower while our mind is moving, while our mind is active. We can only know this unknown knower when the mind is very, very still and very, very subtle. We've allowed the, the, the ripples of the mind to settle and then we can see the reflection very clearly in that. Yeah? And so this is what in the, the, the Zen tradition they say, what is the, the original face you had before you were born? Yeah? And so this is 
that's like a, a paradoxical way of expressing this. That when those ripples come down, you can see that face. Of course, the face was there already, in a way. Okay, when you're looking, if you're looking, if there's water with ripples on it, the light's still coming on, and your reflection, in a sense, is still there. But it's so distorted by all the movement that it's not a face anymore. It's just random patterns of light. And when that's settled, then you see your own face, and that face was already there, in a way. Okay, in another sense, it wasn't there. Yeah? And so we try to express this through using a paradox. What was the original face you had before you were born? And so this is why when that meditation becomes deep like that, that there's a tremendous sense, paradoxical sense, on the one hand of um, uh, something totally new and fresh, going to a completely new land that you've never even imagined. And on the other hand, it feels like coming home. It feels like this is where I've always belonged. And I've, I just have never realized it. And so these, these two um, responses become united at that time. So this is my little talk for you on meditation and Mara and on knowing one's own mind. So I offer this to you for your reflection and amusement.